Section 78 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Asinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Third Petition. 49th Lord's Day, Question 124, which is the Third Petition. Answer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is, grant that we and all men may renounce our own will, and without murmuring obey thy will, which is only good, that so every one may attend to and perform the duties of his station and calling, as willingly and faithfully as the angels do in heaven. Exposition. In considering this petition, we must inquire, first, what is the will of God? Second, what we desire in this petition, and in what does it differ from the second? Third, why is this petition necessary? Fourth, why is it added, as in heaven? First, what is the will of God? The will of God signifies in the scriptures, one, the commandment of God. Ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Psalm 103, verse 21, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. Two, it signifies the events, or rather the decree of God, respecting future events, in which it is continually revealing and manifesting itself, not my will, but thine be done. My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Who hath resisted his will? Luke 22, verse 42, Isaiah 46, verse 10, Romans 9, verse 19. Second, what do we desire in this petition, and in what does it differ from the second? Thy will be done. The sense is, cause and grant, that we may do not our own will, which is corrupt and perverse, but thine, which alone is just and holy, and that we may yield obedience to thee. We desire, therefore, one, a denying of ourselves, which consists in these two parts, one, that we hold ourselves in readiness to give up all our desires and wishes which are in opposition to the law of God. Two, that we hold ourselves in readiness to take up the cross and submit ourselves willingly to God in all things. In offering up this petition, Thy will be done, we pray, therefore, first of all, that God would bestow upon us His grace, so as to enable us to deny and renounce our own corrupt and perverse will, and be willing to suffer the loss of all things contrary to His will. 2. A cheerful and proper discharge of our duty, that everyone in his appropriate sphere may be able to serve God with diligence and to do his will, as well in those duties which are common as in those which are special. Those duties are common which are required not only from us, but also from all Christians, and comprise the virtues necessary for all the godly, as faith, conversion, godliness, charity, temperance, etc., Special duties are those which have respect to our own and to every man's proper calling in life. In praying, therefore, that the will of God may be done, we desire that all these duties may be properly discharged, and that every one may abide in the calling which has been assigned him, and to serve God therein, leaving the final issue of events with God, who disposes and directs all things. 3. We desire that such events as are not contrary to the will of God, and which are pleasing to him, may come to pass. 4. We pray that all our actions and designs may be blessed and prospered, or that God may be pleased out of his infinite good to direct and accompany with his blessing all our actions, counsels, desires, and labors, so that no other events may follow them but such as he knows will most contribute to his glory and our salvation. God wills that we should desire these things from him and leave the final issue of things with himself, we in the meantime properly discharging our duties. To express the whole in a few words, we may say that when we offer up the petition, Thy will be done, we pray that God may, as it were, bury in us all corrupt desires and wishes, and that He alone may work in us by His Spirit, so that we, being sustained by divine grace, may discharge our various duties and carry out the end of our calling. Objection, but the former petition also contains a request that we may rightly perform our duty. Therefore this seems to be superfluous. Answer, we do not here pray for precisely the same thing that we do in the former petition, for in the former we desire that God may commence his kingdom in us by ruling us by his Spirit, who renews our will so that we henceforth, rightly discharging our duty, may render such obedience to our king as becomes subjects of his kingdom. But in this petition we desire that we may all faithfully carry out the will of God respecting us by properly discharging our duties in the different spheres in which we are placed. Or we may express the difference thus. In the former petition, we pray that the church may exist, be preserved and glorified. In this, we ask of God that everyone may properly discharge his duty in the church. 
We may here, as we pass along, notice the connection and difference between the three petitions which we have been considering. The connection between them is of the most intimate character, so much so that no one can exist without the others. The third contributes to the second, and the second to the first, for the name of God is not sanctified unless his kingdom come, nor does the kingdom of God come unless by the use of those means by which it is advanced. These means now are the duties which belong to every man's calling in life. They differ in the following respect. In the first we pray for sanctification, or for the true acknowledgement and praise of God, together with all his works and counsels. In the second we desire the gathering, preservation, and government of the church, and that God may rule us by his word and spirit, defend and protect us, and deliver us from all the evils of guilt and punishment. In the third we desire that everyone may be diligently engaged in his proper place, direct all that he does to the glory of God, and regard whatever God sends upon him as good and calculated to advance his well-being. Third, why is this petition necessary? This petition is necessary, one, that the kingdom of God may come, which is the thing we pray for in the second petition, for unless God bring it to pass that every one in his own peculiar sphere diligently do his will, this kingdom cannot be established, flourish, and be preserved. Two, that we may be in this kingdom. We cannot be members of this kingdom without doing the will of God. Nor can we of ourselves, on account of the corruption of our nature, do the will of God if he does not give us the necessary strength. This strength now God does not grant unto any except those who desire it, Hence it is necessary that we should pray to God that he may impart it unto us. Objection. It is not necessary that we should desire that which is always done and which will certainly come to pass even though we do not pray for it. The will of God is always done and will most certainly come to pass even though we do not desire it. Therefore it is not necessary that we should pray that it may be done. Answer. There is in the major proposition a fallacy in regarding that as a cause which is none, for we do not pray that the will of God may be done as if it would not be done if we did not desire and pray for it, but for other causes, viz. that it may also be done by us, and that the events which God has ordained may contribute to our comfort and salvation. These events will not turn out to our advantage and salvation unless we submit to the will of God and desire only that to be done which God has decreed and desires to be done. We also deny the minor proposition which is false, one, as it respects the calling of every one, because those who do not desire and pray that they may be able in their appropriate sphere to discharge their duty correctly, faithfully and with comfort to themselves, never do it. Two, it is also false as it respects the divine decrees, because God has decreed many events, yet in such a way that he has also decreed the means necessary thereto, and should someone reply, the decrees of God are unchangeable, so that the things which he determines upon will come to pass even without our prayers. We answer, the decrees of God are unchangeable, not only as it respects the event or end, but also as it respects the means which lead to this end. God has decreed to give the end, but it is by the means which lead to it, which is with the condition that we desire and pray for it. Fourth, why is it added, as in heaven? Christ adds the clause, as in heaven, for these two reasons. One, that he might set before us an example of perfection, after which we should strive. Two, that from the desire of perfection we might be assured that God will here grant unto us the commencement, and in the life to come the consummation of all that we desire in reference to his kingdom and will. To him that hath shall be given, Luke 8, verse 18. The reason of both is this, that in heaven the will of God is done perfectly. Does anyone ask by whom? We answer, one, by the Son of God, who does all that the Father wills. Lo, I come, I delight to do thy will, O my God. I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8, John 6, verse 38. Two, by the holy angels and blessed men. The will of God is done in heaven in such a way by the angels that every one of them stands before God ready to do whatever he commands. They do the general and special will of God most promptly and cheerfully. No one declines or refuses to do the service which God requires for them. No one transcends the limits which God has prescribed and in which he requires them to serve him. No one is ashamed to serve us, although we offend them and God by our sins. They are ministering spirits, Hebrews 1 verse 14. It is in this way, therefore, we all desire that we may also obey God and do his will on earth as the holy angels do it in heaven. 
Objection. Things which are impossible should not be desired, but to desire that the will of God may be done on earth as in heaven, or that we may discharge our duty as the angels do in heaven, is impossible. Yea, it is to desire and pray for that which is contrary to the will of God. Therefore, it is not to be sought, since God designs that this shall be our state in the life to come, and not in the present state of being. Answer. In answering this objection, we would make the following distinction in reference to the major proposition. Things which are impossible should not be desired, unless God designs to give them at length to those who desire them. But God wills to give the ability to perform obedience to this his will, to such as desire it, in such a way that they commence this obedience in this life, and shall have it perfected in the life to come. The consummation of it is, therefore, to be ardently desired, whilst the impossibility of it should be patiently endured in this life. The consummation of it should also be desired, that we may at length obtain it, since he who does not desire it will certainly never obtain it. It is one thing not to be able to obtain this consummation, and another thing not to desire it. We also deny the minor proposition, in which there is an error in regarding that as a cause which is no cause, for we do not desire and pray that the consummation of our obedience to God may be accomplished in this life, but that we may here have the commencement, the continuation and increase of this obedience in us, and that at length, after it has been gradually carried forward by constant progression and increase, it may be perfected, and that we may then do the will of God as fully and perfectly as the angels continually do it in heaven. Hence, when we pray that the will of God may be done on earth as in heaven, the word as does not refer to and signify the degree, but the kind of obedience here alluded to, viz. the beginning of it, the desire and obtaining of which is not contrary to the divine decree. And as to the consummation of this obedience, it is proper that we should every moment desire and pray that we may be wholly delivered from sin, for it is agreeable to the will of God that we should pray for this, even though he does not design to perfect it in this life. It is not proper for us to search and scrutinize into what God has decreed, when we have this rule prescribed, that we pray for things upon the condition of the will of God. We should therefore submit ourselves to the divine will, and pray for what God has commanded us to ask of him, whether he has decreed it or not. God, for instance, wills the death of our parents, and yet does not design that we should desire and pray for their death. So God also wills that the church should have her seasons of affliction and oppression, but does not desire that we should pray for these afflictions, but for her deliverance, or that she may patiently submit to the afflictions which he sees fit to send upon her. So it is now in reference to the subject in hand. God does not design to give us perfect deliverance from sin in this life, and yet he wills that we should desire it and constantly pray that we may be wholly delivered from sin. There are, therefore, some things to be sought and prayed for which God will not bring to pass, and, on the other hand, there are some things which God designs to bring to pass which we are not to desire and pray for, but patiently to endure if they do come to pass. And yet in doing this we do not pray contrary to the will of God, because we always submit ourselves to his will in our prayers. End of section 78 Section 79 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fourth Petition 50th Lord's Day, question 125, which is the fourth petition, answer, give us this day our daily bread, that is, be pleased to provide us with all things necessary for the body, that we may thereby acknowledge thee to be the only fountain of all good, and that neither our care nor industry nor even thy gifts can profit us without thy blessing, and therefore that we may withdraw our trust from all creatures and place it in thee alone. Exposition this petition respecting our daily bread, it would seem, should have been placed after the petition in which we pray for the forgiveness of our sins, inasmuch as such benefits as are most important should be prayed for first, whilst those which are less important should be sought last. But Christ, having regard to our infirmities, placed this fourth petition respecting our daily bread, as it were in the middle of the prayer which he prescribed, that we might both commence and end our prayers with petitions for spiritual blessings as being most important and that the obtaining and receiving of temporal benefits might confirm in us more and more a confidence of obtaining spiritual blessings. In this fourth petition we are taught to pray for temporal blessings, concerning which we must inquire, first, why temporal blessings should be prayed for, second, in what manner they are to be sought, 
Third, why Christ comprehends temporal blessings under the term bread. Fourth, why he calls it our bread. Fifth, why he calls it daily bread. Sixth, why it should be given daily. Seventh, whether it is lawful for us to pray for riches. Eighth, whether it is lawful to lay up anything for the time to come. First, why temporal blessings should be prayed for. We should desire and pray for temporal blessings from God, no less than such as are spiritual, one on account of the command of God, which of itself should be sufficient, even though we should assign no other reason. We have as a warrant for asking temporal blessings from God both a general and special command. Christ gives a general command when he says, Ask and it shall be given you, Matthew 7 verse 7. We have also a special command uttered by Christ when he prescribed unto us this form of prayer, saying, After this manner therefore pray ye, in which he also commands us to ask bread or temporal blessings from God. When Christ therefore commands us to take no thought in regard to what we shall eat, and says that all these things shall be added unto us, he does not design to forbid us to ask of God our daily bread, but condemns distrust or a want of confidence in God. Matthew 5, verses 31 and 33. 2. On account of the divine promise, God has promised to give us all things necessary for our life, and has promised them in order that we might desire and pray for them, and that we might have a firm confidence that we shall obtain things necessary for us, which confidence is spiritual and not carnal. Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Matthew 6, verse 32. 3. On account of the glory of God. This petition for temporal blessings is an acknowledgement and profession of the providence of God, especially towards the church. God desires that this praise should be given to him, inasmuch as he is the source of all good things, and that we may not suppose these things to come by mere chance. For, on account of our comfort, that they may be expressions of God's good will towards us, since good gifts, such as contribute to salvation, are promised and conferred only upon the children of God. Hence, when these gifts are conferred upon us, we should comfort ourselves by believing that we are of the number of those whom God has promised to grant these things. 5. That the desire and expectation of these blessings may be an exercise of our confidence and hope, for we cannot promise to ourselves temporal blessings unless we are assured of spiritual blessings and of God's good will towards us. Neither can we desire and pray for temporal blessings from God unless we are persuaded that we are in favor with Him. 6. On account of our necessity that we may be able to do the will of God on earth. This we cannot do without daily bread. The dead praise not the Lord, Psalm 115, verse 17. 7. That the desire of these things may be a confirmation to us and a profession before the world that it is God who confers upon us even the smallest gifts. 8. For this comfort, that we may know that the church shall always be preserved on earth, since God always hears our prayers and will constantly grant unto us our daily bread according to his promise. 2. In what manner temporal blessings are to be prayed for? Temporal blessings are to be sought and prayed for, as well as other good things promised in the gospel, one with confidence in the promise of God, or from faith. If we offer up our prayers differently, they are not heard, neither are the good things which we have made contributory to our salvation. Two, with the condition of the will of God, that God would give us what we pray for, if it be pleasing to him, and as he knows they may contribute to our advantage and his glory, because he has promised these things not with any determined circumstances. God has not prescribed in his word what temporal blessings he will confer upon us. It is different, however, as it respects spiritual blessings, for in reference to these God has expressly promised that he will give them to everyone that asks. 3. With confidence of being heard, so that we believe that God will give us as much as is necessary to meet our wants. 4. To this end, that we may in the use of these things serve God and our neighbor, and not that they may contribute to our sensual desire. Those who do not in this way desire these blessings are not heard, and although they may receive what they ask, yet God does not hear them, because the things which they receive are not made profitable for their salvation. There are two reasons why God has not specified in his word what temporal blessings he will confer upon us, as the salvation of everyone and the manifestation of his own glory demands. 1. Because we are often ignorant what we should pray for and what would be good for us. God knows best what blessings it is desirable that he should confer upon us for the manifestation of his own glory and our salvation. As we, therefore, often err in asking temporal blessings, God confers only such upon us as he knows will be profitable for us. 
It is different, however, as it respects spiritual blessings, because these are all profitable unto us, and God has prescribed the way in which we are to pray for them, so that we cannot err in desiring them. For what God has positively promised, that we ought to desire positively, and what he has specially and simply promised, that we should seek and pray for in the same way. So we should simply desire and pray for the Holy Ghost, because God has simply and expressly promised to give the Holy Ghost to everyone that asks. Two, that we may learn to be contented with those things which we have received from God, and always submit our will to the will of God. Third, why Christ comprehends temporal blessings under the term bread. One, Christ, by a synecdoche which is common in the Hebrew language, comprehends under the term bread all temporal blessings and such as are necessary for the sustenance of life, as food, raiment, health, civil peace, etc. This is evident from the design of the petition, for we pray for bread from our necessity, but there are many other things besides bread necessary for us. Therefore we pray for them also under the term bread. This synecdoche, so common in the Hebrew language, often occurs in the Bible, as in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. He that did eat of my bread hath lifted up his heel against me. Genesis 3 verse 19, Psalm 41 verse 9. Nor did Christ merely comprehend under the term bread things necessary for the sustenance of life, but he also comprises such a use of these things as is profitable. For bread, apart from such use, is no better than a stone. 2. Christ furthermore comprehends all temporal blessings under the term bread. 1. That he might restrain our desires and teach us to pray only for such things as are necessary for the support of life and for the service of God and our neighbor, both in our common and proper calling. 2. That he might teach us to pray not only for such things as are necessary, but also that the use of them might be made profitable to us and tend to our salvation inasmuch as these things profit us nothing without such a use. Bread now is made profitable to us, one, if we pray for it and receive it with faith, or with the intention, after the manner and to the end which God directs, which requires that we look in the exercise of faith to God, the author and giver of all good things. Two, if we desire that God will give, with the bread which we receive, the virtue and power of nourishing and preserving our bodies, which requires that we do not merely pray for bread itself, but also for the blessing of God, For if God does not bless us in that which we receive, all our cares and labors are in vain, and the gifts of God themselves are therefore useless and hurtful, according to the threatening, I will break the staff of your bread. Leviticus 26 verse 26. We may now easily see what we desire when we pray for bread, viz. 1. Not great riches, but only such things as are necessary for us. 2. That these things may be to us bread, or may be profitable and salutary, by the blessing of God without which bread is not bread, but becomes, as it were, a stone or poison. For he who gives bread, that it may not profit him that receives it any more than if it were a stone, gives a stone and not bread. Such now are the blessings which the wicked receive from God, and take, as it were, to themselves. Fourth, why does Christ call it our bread? Christ commands us to pray for our bread, and not for mine or thine, or any other man's, one, that we may desire those things which are given to us of God, for the bread which God gives us as necessary for the support of life is, and is made ours, when it is given unto us. This petition, therefore, give us our bread, signifies, give us, O God, the bread allotted to us, and which thou dost design shall be ours. God, as a householder, distributes to every one his own portion, or that which we deserve at his hands. 2. That we may desire things necessary, acquired by lawful labor in some honest and proper calling, pleasing to God and profitable to society at large, or that we may receive what we ask at the hands of God by ordinary means and lawful ways, the hand of God reaching them to us from heaven. This we command you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good." 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10, Ephesians 4 verse 28. 3. That we may use them with a good conscience and with thanksgiving, for God desires that we should take unto ourselves the assurance that when he gives us these things he also grants unto us the privilege of enjoying his gifts. God desires that we should use his gifts not as thieves and robbers, but cheerfully and with thanksgiving. 5. Why does Christ call it daily bread? Christ calls the bread which we are commanded to ask of God daily bread, one, because he will have us to ask daily as much as we need for each day, two, because he would restrain our raging and boundless desires. Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. 
There is no want to them that fear him. Matthew 6 verse 32, Psalm 37 verse 16, Psalm 34 verse 9. Hence the petition, give us our daily bread, means give us as much bread as is sufficient for us, give us so much of what is necessary for the support of life as every one of us needs to serve thee and our neighbor in our several callings in life. Sixth, why does Christ add this day? Christ adds the phrase this day, one, that he might meet and guard against our distrust and covetousness and keep us from both these vices, two, that we might depend upon him alone as yesterday, so this day and tomorrow, and also expect the necessaries of life from the hands of God, that we may know that they are not obtained by our own hands or labor or diligence, but that God confers them upon us, and that we may know that even though we receive them, yet they will not profit our bodies if the blessing of God does not accompany them. 3. That the exercise of faith and prayer may always be continued in us, for as long as it is said this day, so long does Christ design that prayer should be continued, that we may yield obedience to the command to pray always. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17. Seventh, Is it lawful for us to pray for riches? This, in connection with the following question, naturally grows out of what we have already said in reference to this petition, for when we are commanded to pray only for our daily bread, and that to this day, it would seem at first view that it is not lawful either to desire riches or to lay anything by for tomorrow. It is, however, certainly right and proper to desire riches if we remove all ambiguity from the word and understand by it things which are necessary for the support of life. It was in this way also that Epicurus defined riches, quote, to be a poverty adapted to the law of nature, end quote. This is a good definition of the term, for they are to be considered truly rich, who enjoy a sufficient amount of the things necessary for the support of life, and are contented therewith. If we therefore understand the term riches as just defined, they are certainly to be sought and prayed for at the hands of God, inasmuch as we are to desire such things as are necessary for nature and for the position and office which God has assigned us in life. And the reason is that these necessary things or riches are the daily bread which we are commanded to ask and pray for at the hands of God. There are others, again, who define the term differently, understanding by it an abundance and plenty over and above what is necessary. So Croesus, so named the rich, said, quote, that no one is rich unless he was able to support an army by his revenue, end quote. In this sense, riches are never to be asked of God, seeing that this is not to pray for our daily bread. Solomon says in the person of all the godly, give me neither poverty nor riches, Proverbs 30 verse 8 by which words the Holy Ghost teaches that riches, when understood to mean an abundance over and above what is necessary, are to be deprecated by us. The declaration of the Apostle Paul in his first epistle to Timothy, chapter 6, verse 9, is also here in point, where he says, They that will be rich fall into temptations and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition, Christ also calls riches thorns, which we cannot handle without exposing ourselves to the danger of being pricked thereby, Matthew 13, verse 22. But on the other hand, godliness is great gain if a man be contented with what he has, 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. Should God, however, give us anything besides what is actually necessary for us, we should use these things properly, or reserve them for purposes good and necessary, for Christ commanded the disciples to gather up the fragments that nothing might be lost, John 6, verse 12. We have also a remarkable example in the person of Joseph, who, being warned of the approaching famine, gathered and laid by provisions in the time of plenty for the years of scarcity and dearth which were to come upon the land of Egypt. Genesis 41 verse 48. But here care must be taken, one, that we do not repose our trust in them. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. Psalm 62 verse 10. Two, that we avoid luxury and every abuse of the gifts of God. 3. We should regard ourselves as stewards of God who has committed these riches to our charge for the purpose of being properly expended and has imposed upon us the duty of administering them so as to promote his glory and that we shall at some time be required to render an account to God for our stewardship and administration. 8. Is it lawful for us to lay anything by for the time to come? That it is right and proper for us to lay something by for the time to come may be inferred from the command of Christ gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. John 6 verse 12. The same thing is also taught by the word our, as it is here used. For we are required to aid and contribute to the support of the commonwealth, and to give to the poor as opportunity presents itself. 
This, however, we cannot do unless we lay something of our own by, so that we may have something to give whenever any occasion calls for the exercise of our liberality. We may here appropriately refer to all the precepts and rules which the scriptures give respecting parsimony and frugality, which virtues are employed in keeping and profitably disposing of things honestly acquired for one's own use and for the benefit of his friends, so as to avoid all sumptuousness, prodigality, luxury, and waste of the gift of God. The Apostle Paul teaches that it is the duty of parents to lay something in store for their children when he says, The children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 14. These three things should, however, be observed in laying up possessions for the time to come. One, that the things which are laid by in store be lawfully gotten, having been acquired by honest and lawful labor. Two, that we do not repose our confidence in them. Three, that they be preserved for lawful and necessary purposes, both as it respects ourselves and others, such as a proper support of our own life and for our families, for the preservation of the church and state, and for administering to the wants of the poor and needy, concerning which we may cite the following passages of Scripture. Trust not in oppression, and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Psalm 62, verse 11, Ephesians 4, verse 28. We may now easily return an answer to the objections which are brought against this petition. Objection 1. It is not necessary to desire and pray for what is ours. Daily bread is ours, therefore we need not desire it from God. Answer. There are here four terms arising from the ambiguity of the word our, which in the major proposition signifies a thing which we have in our own power, whilst in the minor it signifies a thing which becomes ours by the gift of God, or which we obtain from God by prayer, as we have already shown. Objection 2. It is not necessary that we should labor for that which is obtained not by labor, but by prayer. Our daily bread is obtained not by labor, but by prayer. Therefore, we should not labor for it, but merely pray. Answer. There is here an error in regarding that as absolutely true, which is true only in part. Those things which are simply not obtained by labor, neither as a cause nor as the necessary means, for these it is to no purpose that we labor. But although our labor is not necessary for the purpose of obtaining temporal benefits as the whole or principal efficient cause, yet it is nevertheless necessary as a means instituted by God, according as it is said, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground. This we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Genesis 3 verse 19, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10. God gives all things freely, but not without labor and prayer on our part. Objection 3. Christ here commands us to pray for our daily bread, and this day, and not tomorrow. Therefore, it is not lawful to lay anything in store for the time to come. Why then does Paul say that parents ought to lay up for their children? 2 Corinthians 12 verse 14. Answer. This objection is of no account, inasmuch as it regards that as a cause which is none. Christ commands us to pray for our daily bread, and this day... Hence we are to ask that which is necessary for every day, this day, tomorrow, and as long as we live. We are, therefore, not to understand Christ as teaching that he will not have us to labor for the morrow, or that we are not to lay anything by for the future, or that we are to cast away those things which God has already given us as sufficient for the time to come. For his object is to remove from us distrust, covetousness, and an unrighteous acquisition of goods and disobedience. He does indeed say, in another place, take no thought for the morrow, Matthew 6, verse 34, but his meaning evidently is that we should not think of the morrow with distrust, as though God would then give us nothing, or as though it would not be necessary for us to pray. He does not, therefore, forbid labor and prayer, but merely distrust and a want of confidence in God. End of section 79. Section 80 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fifth Petition. 51st Lord's Day, Question 126. What is the Fifth Petition? Answer. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That is, be pleased for the sake of Christ's blood not to impute to us poor sinners our transgressions, nor that depravity which always cleaves to us, even as we feel this evidence of thy grace in us that it is our firm resolution from the heart to forgive our neighbor. 
exposition. Cyprian correctly and piously observes, respecting the order and argument of this fifth petition, that we pray for the pardon and forgiveness of our sins after praying for a supply of food, that he who is fed by God may live in God. Nor do we merely have regard for this present temporal life, but also for that which is eternal, to which all those attain whose sins are pardoned. This same father likewise observes that this petition is a remarkable and free confession of the church in which she acknowledges and deplores her sins, and is at the same time a comfort that the church shall receive the forgiveness of sins according to the promise of Christ, and also binds us to extend forgiveness to our neighbor. Christ, therefore, by this petition wills, one, that we acknowledge our sins, two, that we thirst and long after the forgiveness of sins, inasmuch as this is granted to none but such as desire it, and who do not trample underfoot the blood of the Son of God. 3. That our faith may be exercised, seeing that this petition springs from faith and also confirms faith. For faith is the cause of prayer, and prayer is the cause of faith as it respects the increase thereof. The principal questions which claim our attention in connection with this petition are the following. First, what does Christ mean by debts? Second, what is it to forgive debts or sins? Third, why is the forgiveness of sins to be prayed for? Fourth, how are sins remitted unto us, or what is the meaning of the clause, as we forgive our debtors? First, what does Christ mean by debts? Christ comprises under the term debts all our sins, original as well as actual, including sins of ignorance, of omission and commission, as he himself explains it in Luke 11 verse 4, where he says, Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. They are called debts because they make us debtors to God, both in respect to the obedience which we have failed to render, and also to the punishment which we are bound to pay in consequence thereof. For when we sin, we neither give nor perform to God what we owe Him, and as long as we do not yield this to Him, so long do we remain debtors to God, and are bound to make satisfaction by punishment. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. Deuteronomy 27 verse 26 from this state of condemnation we could never be delivered if God did not remit unto us our sins. Second, what is it to remit debts or to forgive sins? A creditor is said to forgive a debtor when he does not demand from him that which he owes him, but blots his account from his books without exacting any punishment, as though it had been paid, as we may learn from the parable of the king who in view of the entreaties of the servant that owed him ten thousand talents forgave him the debt, Matthew 18, verse 27. So God forgives our debts when he does not lay them to our account, nor punish us on account of them, and that because he has punished them in his Son, our Mediator. This, therefore, is what we are to understand by the forgiveness of sins, that God does not impute any sin to us, but graciously receives us into his favor, declares us righteous, and regards us as his children out of his mere grace and mercy for the sake of the satisfaction which Christ made in our behalf, imputed unto us and apprehended of us by faith, and that he will therefore not punish us on account of our sins, but grants unto us righteousness and eternal life, since the remission of sin does away with the punishment of sin, for sin and punishment are correlatives. When sin is introduced or committed, punishment follows, but when it is taken away, punishment is at the same time removed. Objection. To remit sin is not to impute it, nor to be willing to punish it in us. But this is inconsistent with the justice of God. Therefore, when we pray that God will remit sin, we desire that he will act contrary to the order of his justice. Answer. We deny the consequence because the order of divine justice is not violated when God pardons sin, except he pardons it without any satisfaction being made. But it is not in this way that we pray for the forgiveness of sins, inasmuch as we desire it on account of the satisfaction of Christ. Hence, when our sins are remitted, there is no wrong done to the order of divine justice, as it is not done without satisfaction having been made. And if some should reply that God does not graciously and freely remit our sins, if he does it in view of a recompense having been made, we answer that they are forgiven in view of a recompense having been made, and therefore not freely in respect to Christ, but freely in respect to us, since he does not receive satisfaction from us, but from Christ. And if it should still further be objected that remission of sins is not granted freely, since we have merited it in Christ, we answer that the merit on account of which our sins are pardoned is not ours, but Christ's, who was given by the Father freely for us, 
and merited this forgiveness for us without the intervention of any desert on our part, and that this his merit is freely imputed unto us. Hence our sins are graciously forgiven on account of the merit of Christ, from which it is correctly inferred that they are not imputed unto us on account of the satisfaction of Christ. For we do not desire that God would act contrary to his justice, and that he would not regard us as sinners, but that he would not impute unto us the righteousness of another, even the righteousness of Christ, with which our sins are covered. To express it more briefly, we would say, God remits our sins freely, one, because he does not demand any satisfaction from us, two, because he freely gave his Son, in whom he made satisfaction, three, because he graciously gives and imputes the satisfaction of his Son to such as believe. Third, why should we desire the forgiveness of sins? We should desire and pray for the forgiveness of sin, one, on account of our salvation, that we may be saved, for without the forgiveness of sins we cannot be saved. Neither does God confer this benefit upon any but such as desire it. Two, that we may be admonished and reminded of the remains of sin which still cleave even to the most holy in this life, and that our repentance may thus become more earnest and deep. Three, that we may desire and receive the former blessings, because without the remission of sins these blessings are either not given or else they are given to their destruction. So the wicked often receive these gifts, but not to their salvation, for they rather contribute to their condemnation. Objection. It is not necessary that we should desire and pray for what we have. The godly have the remission of their sins, therefore there is no need that they should desire it. Answer. The godly do indeed enjoy the forgiveness of sins, but not wholly, and that too not in respect to the continuance, but merely as it respects the beginning thereof. This forgiveness should without doubt be continued, inasmuch as sins are continually found even in the regenerate. God does also continue it in all those to whom he forgives sin in his Son, but with the condition that we daily desire this continuance. Hence, although God has forgiven our sins for Christ's sake, yet he nevertheless designs that we should pray for their forgiveness. It is for this reason that we pray that God would forgive us the sins which we now or may hereafter commit. Fourth, how are sins remitted unto us, or why is it added, as we forgive our debtors? Our sins are so remitted unto us, as we also forgive our debtors, which clause is added by Christ, one, that we may rightly desire and pray for the forgiveness of our sins, and may therefore come before God in true faith and penitence, the sign of which is love to our neighbor. Two, on account of our comfort, that we may be assured of the forgiveness of our sins, when we extend forgiveness to others for the sins which they may have committed against us, and may have the assurance that we are acceptable to God, although there are many remains of sin still within us. Objection 1. He is not pardoned who himself does not forgive. We do not forgive, therefore we are not forgiven. Answer. He who does not forgive fully and perfectly does nevertheless obtain forgiveness if he does but forgive truly and sincerely. Therefore forgiveness shall also be extended to us if we forgive truly and sincerely. Objection 2. Christ commands us to pray that God will forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. But we do not perfectly forgive our debtors. Therefore we, according to this petition, pray that God will not perfectly forgive us our sins, which is to desire our destruction, since God will condemn even the smallest sin. Answer. This is to put a false construction upon the words of Christ, for the particle as, as used in this petition, does not signify the degree of forgiveness, or teach that the forgiveness which we extend to others is equal to that which God extends to us, but it signifies the kind of forgiveness or the truth and sincerity of the forgiveness which we and God extend, that God will as truly forgive us as we certainly and truly forgive our neighbor from the heart. Or, to express it more briefly, we may say that there is here not a comparison according to the degrees, but according to the truth and reality of the thing, so that the sense is, God so perfectly forgives us our sins, as we truly and certainly forgive our neighbor. Objection 3. But Christ commands us in Luke to pray, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Luke 11 verse 4. Therefore our forgiveness is the cause on account of which God forgives us. Answer. But this is to consider that as a cause which is none. Our forgiveness is not meritorious or the cause of divine forgiveness, but is merely an argument and proof that God has forgiven us our sins, since we have forgiven others, if not perfectly, yet still truly and sincerely. Our forgiveness cannot be the cause of the forgiveness of God, one, because it is imperfect, 
to, because if it were even perfect, it could still not merit anything for the reason that what we now do we owe to God. If we were now to perform perfect obedience, it would still be due to God. Yet we must not understand this as signifying an equality of forgiveness in us and God, but only as referring to a comparison of the kind of forgiveness. Objection 4. He does not truly forgive who retains a recollection of injuries and is desirous of taking revenge. But we all have a recollection of injuries and are desirous of taking revenge. Therefore we do not truly forgive. Answer. He does not truly forgive who retains a recollection of injuries without showing any signs of disapprobation or making any resistance thereto, and although we may scarcely be able to bury all remembrance of offences, or at least not without the greatest difficulty, yet if we only do not cherish it, but resist the remains of sin which still cleave to us and do not give indulgence to them, there is nothing which may prevent us from true and heartily forgiving others, and of obtaining that also, on account of which Christ has added the particle as, which is, as has already been remarked, that we might rightly pray to God, which takes place whenever we pray in faith and repentance, both of which are confirmed in us by this petition. Faith is strengthened and confirmed in us by this petition, because when we truly extend forgiveness to our neighbor, we may and ought certainly to believe that our sins are also forgiven us, so that we have a good conscience and are sure of being heard, according to the promise of Christ, If ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Matthew 6 verse 14 True repentance is in like manner confirmed and increased within us by this petition, since it was chiefly to lead and provoke us to this that the condition was added, as we forgive our debtors. For if we would obtain forgiveness for ourselves, we must also extend forgiveness to others. Both causes are contained in the words of Christ as just cited. If ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That is, then you may certainly believe that you will be heard of your Father in heaven, which words comprehend a confirmation of our faith whilst the antithesis which follows adds a spur, or provokes to repentance. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Matthew 6, verse 15. Objection 5. But Paul did not forgive Alexander, for he says, 2 Timothy 2, verse 4, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Yet he obtained forgiveness of God. Therefore our forgiveness is not necessary in order that we may obtain the forgiveness of God. Answer. Forgiveness is threefold. One, of revenge. This pertains to all men inasmuch as all ought to forgive revenge. It is of this that this petition speaks, and this Paul forgave Alexander. Two, of punishment. This all cannot forgive as all cannot inflict punishment. Neither ought the magistrate to whom it belongs to inflict punishment to remit it, except for just and weighty reasons, for God desires that his justice and law should be put into execution. This Paul also forgave Alexander in as far as it had respect to him. Yet he at the same time desired that he should be punished of God in case he would persist in sin. 3. Of judgment in reference to others. This should not always be remitted for God, who prohibits falsehood, will not have us to judge of knaves as honest men, but desires that we should distinguish the good from the bad. Christ enjoins the same thing when he says, Give not that which is holy to the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Matthew 7, verse 6, chapter 10, verse 16. Paul did not, therefore, sin in entertaining an opinion of Alexander as a wicked man, as long as he did not repent of his wickedness. End of section 80. Section 81 of Commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Ursinus, translated by G. W. Williard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sixth Petition 52nd Lord's Day, Question 127, which is the Sixth Petition. Answer, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That is, since we are so weak in ourselves that we cannot stand a moment. And besides this, since our mortal enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, cease not to assault us. Do thou therefore preserve and strengthen us by the power of thy Holy Spirit, that we may not be overcome in this spiritual warfare, but constantly and strenuously may resist our foes, until at last we obtain a complete victory. Exposition. There are some who here make one petition, while others make two. We should not, however, strive or contend in reference to the matter as long as the doctrine which is here taught is fully retained. To us the words seem rather to constitute two parts of one and the same petition. Lead us not into temptation, 
is a petition for deliverance from future evil, but deliver us from evil is a petition for deliverance from present evil. The things which we are here to consider are the following. First, what is temptation? Second, what is it to lead into temptation? Third, what is it to deliver from evil? Fourth, why is this petition necessary? First, what is temptation? There are two kinds of temptation. The one is from God, the other is from the devil. The former is a trial of our faith, piety, repentance, and obedience, which is from God, through the various oppositions and hindrances of our salvation. As by all evils, by the devil, the flesh, lusts, the world, afflictions, calamities, the cross, etc., that our faith, patience, hope, and constancy may be made manifest both to ourselves and others. It is in this sense that God is said to have tempted Abraham, Joseph, Job, and David. The Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Deuteronomy 13 verse 4, see also Genesis 22 verse 1, Psalm 139 verse 1. So God is also said to tempt his people by false prophets and by the cross. The temptation of the devil, or that by which the devil, the flesh, and the wicked tempt us, is every solicitation to do wrong, which solicitation itself is sin. It was in this way that the devil tempted Job, that he might draw him from God, whom he loved and worshipped, although the final issue of the temptation was different from what the devil designed and anticipated. So he also provoked David to number the children of Israel, 1 Chronicles 21 verse 1. Objection. But it is said in the epistle of James, chapter 1 verse 13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted of evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Answer. God tempts no one by soliciting and enticing him to sin or evil, but he tempts us by trying us. But the devil, the world, and the flesh tempt us so as to entice and solicit us to sin for the purpose of drawing us from God. In this sense of the term, God tempts no man. Hence, when it is said that he tempted Abraham, Job, and David, we are to understand it to mean nothing more than a trial of their faith and constancy by afflictions and the cross. So he also, by the use of the same means, tries our faith, hope, patience, love, and constancy, whether we will also worship and serve him in afflictions. From what has now been said, we may easily perceive, since temptation is attributed to the devil and to the disordered inclinations of men, in what sense God is said to tempt and not to tempt men. Satan tempts men both by offering occasions to sin from without and also by instigating them from within to sin, that he may thus plunge them into destruction and cast reproach upon God. Disordered inclinations tempt men because they tend to such actions as God prohibits. God, however, tempts not to destroy us, nor to lead us into sin, but to try and exercise us, when he either sends calamities upon us, or permits the devil or men or our flesh to provoke and invite us to sin, hiding for a time his grace and power in preserving and ruling us, that our faith and constancy by these exercises and trials may be more clearly manifested, not indeed to God, who knows from everlasting what and how great our faith is, and how great it will hereafter be by his blessing, but to ourselves and others, that so, by these examples of our deliverance, there may be confirmed in us a confidence of the divine presence and protection, that a desire of imitating us may be awakened in others by seeing our perseverance, and that true gratitude may be kindled in all of us towards God, who has delivered us from our temptations. It was in this way that God tempted Abraham when he commanded him to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. Genesis 22. So he is said to have tempted his people by withholding water from them, Exodus 15. This petition, therefore, lead us not into temptation, which Christ commands us to address to God, does not simply speak of the trials and proofs of our faith and piety, to which David willingly offers himself when he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart, try me and know my thoughts, but also of the cunning devices and assaults of the devil and of our flesh, and of desertion in external and internal conflicts. Nor does the Apostle James speak of our being tried, but of our being enticed to sin when he says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. James 1 verses 13 to 16. Hence, it is also apparent how God punishes the wicked and chastises and tempts the godly by evil spirits, whilst he is nevertheless not the cause of these sins which are committed by the devil, 
nor is a partaker with them in his wickedness. For that the wicked are punished by the wicked, and the good chastised and exercised is the just and holy work of the divine will, but that the wicked execute the judgment of God by sinning is not the fault of God, but comes to pass by the corruption of the wicked, which they have brought upon themselves, God neither willing nor approving nor accomplishing nor furthering their sins, but only permitting them, in his just judgment, when accomplishing his work and purpose through them, he either does not reveal his will to them, or does not influence their wills to regard his revealed will as the end and rule of their actions. This distinction between the works of God and those of the devil, and of God's accomplishing his just work through the devil, and of his permitting the sin of the devil, is evidently confirmed by the history of Job, whom God designed to try, whilst the devil attempted to destroy him. The same thing is also proven by the history of Ahab, and by the prophecy respecting Antichrist, where the devil deceives men that he may destroy them, whilst God permits them to be deceived, that he may in this way punish them, and suffers the devil to execute his will and purpose. 1 Kings 23, 2 Thessalonians 2. Second, what is it to lead into temptation? When God is said to lead us into temptation, we are to understand by it that he tries and proves us according to his most just will and judgments. When the devil is said to lead us into temptation, it means that God permits him to entice and solicit us to sin. We are here in this petition taught to pray for deliverance from both of these forms of temptation. We therefore pray, one, that God will not tempt us for the sake of trying us, if such be his will and pleasure, or, if he does tempt us, that he will give us strength to endure the temptation. Two, that he will not permit the devil, or the world, or the flesh to entice us to sin, or, if he does permit us to be tempted, that he himself will be present with us, that we may not fall into sin. This, therefore, is the true sense and meaning of this petition, lead us not into temptation, suffer us not to be tempted above that which we are able to bear, neither permit the devil to tempt us in such a way that we may either sin or wholly fall from the objection. Temptations which are good in respect to God are evil in respect to the devil, and yet God, notwithstanding, leads us into them. Therefore God is the cause of sin. Answer. There is here a fallacy of the accident. They are sins in respect to the devil because he designs to entice us to sin by these temptations. In respect to God, however, they are not sins because they try us and withdraw us from sin and also confirm our faith. Temptations, therefore, in as far as they are trials, chastisements, martyrdoms, etc., are sent of God. But in as far as they are evil and sinful, God does not will them so as to approve and affect them, but only permits them. Third, what is it to deliver us from evil? There are some who understand by the term evil, as here used, the devil. Others understand by it sin and others death. It is best, however, to understand it as comprehending all the evils of guilt and punishment, whether they be present or future, yea, and the devil himself, the author and grand contriver of all wicked deeds, who is called by the Apostle John, according to a significant form of speech, the wicked one. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. Whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. 1 John 2, verse 13, Matthew 5, verse 37. Cyprian understood the term evil as here used to include all the adverse circumstances which the enemy brings against us, from which we can have no sure protection except God deliver us. Hence, when we pray that God will deliver us from evil, we desire, one, that he will send no evil upon us, but keep and defend us from present and future evils, both of guilt and punishment. 2. That if he does here send evils upon us, he will be pleased to mitigate them and make them contribute to our salvation, that they may be profitable to us. 3. That he will at length fully and perfectly deliver us in the life to come and wipe away all tears from our eyes. 4. Why is this petition necessary? This petition is necessary, 1. On account of the number and power of our enemies, together with the magnitude of the evils to which we are exposed, and our own weakness. 2. On account of the preceding petition, that we may obtain the forgiveness of our sins, inasmuch as our sins are not forgiven, except we continue in faith and repentance. But we will not continue in these, if we are tempted above our strength, if we rush into sin and fall from God himself. Objection 1. We should not pray for deliverance from things good and profitable to us. The temptations which are from God, such as trials by afflictions, poverty, false prophets, etc., are things good and profitable to us. Therefore, we should not pray for deliverance from them. Answer, we are not to pray for deliverance from things which are in themselves good and profitable. But trials, afflictions, crosses, and other temptations are profitable not in themselves, 
but only by an accident, which is the mercy of God accompanying them, without which they are not only not profitable, but constitute a part of death, and lead to death both temporal and eternal. Hence, in as far as afflictions are evil in themselves and destructive to our nature, in so far are we to pray for a deliverance from them. But, in as far as they are by the goodness of God good and profitable to those who believe, we should not desire to be delivered from them. Or we may express it thus, that which is good and which accompanies afflictions and the cross, we should not pray for deliverance from, but afflictions and the cross itself, which are evil in themselves, being destructive to our nature. From these we should pray for deliverance, as Christ himself also prayed when he said, Let this cup pass from me, that is, let it pass from me, in as far as it is a destruction and evil, in which sense the Father himself did not desire it. But in as far as the death of Christ was a ransom for the sins of his people, in so far both Christ and the Father desired it. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Matthew 26, verse 39. Objection 2. We ought not to pray for deliverance from what God wills, but God wills our temptations. Therefore, we ought not to pray for deliverance from them. Answer. We ought not to pray for deliverance from what God wills, in as far as he simply wills it, but he does not simply will temptations. He does not will them in as far as they are destructive to us, but only in as far as they are trials and exercises of our faith, prayer, and constancy. In this respect, we ought also to desire these things, and that we ought not simply to desire temptations is evident from this, that it is the part of patience to endure and submit to them, which it would not be, but rather our duty, if we should simply desire them without being permitted to pray for deliverance from them. God will not, therefore, have us to desire evils in as far as they are evils, but will have us patiently to endure them in as far as they are good and profitable to us. Objection 3. It is in vain that we pray for what we never obtain, but we shall never obtain a complete deliverance from temptations in this life, for all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. Therefore, it is in vain that we pray not to be led into temptation. Answer. There is here an error in regarding that as a cause which is none, for we pray that we may not be led into temptation, not because we are here wholly to be delivered from temptations, but because we are delivered from many temptations and evils in which we should have perished, had we not sought and prayed for deliverance. This should be a sufficient reason why we should pray as we are here taught. But we may add still further that this petition is necessary in order that the evils into which we fall may be made contributory to our salvation. Those now who desire deliverance in general obtain these two great blessings from God, notwithstanding he designs that this benefit be imperfect, even to those who desire it, on account of the remains of sin which still cleave to us, and that because he will have us to pray with confidence and submission to his will, that we may obtain it fully and perfectly in the life to come. The benefit of this petition is, one, a confession of our weakness in enduring temptations, even the smallest, that no one may be unduly exalted and filled with conceit, as Peter was when he declared himself willing to die with Christ, and that no one may take to himself the glory of his confession and sufferings, seeing that the Lord himself teaches us humility, saying, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Matthew 26, verse 41, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. 2. A declaration of the miseries and evils of this present life, that we may not become secure and fall in love with the world. 3. An acknowledgment and confession of the providence of God, which, as Cyprian writes, teaches that the devil can effect nothing against us except God first give him permission, which should lead us to reverence and fear God, since the wicked one can accomplish nothing in all our temptations except God give him power to do so. God now grants Satan power over us, according as we permit sin to reign in us, as it is said, Who gave Jacob for a spoil, and Israel to the robbers, did not the Lord? He against whom we have sinned, for they would not walk in his ways, neither were obedient to his law. Isaiah 42 verse 24 This power too, which is given to Satan, is twofold, either for our punishment when we sin against God, or for our glory when we are tried and exposed. This is Cyprian's view of the subject. It is proper that we should here notice the order and connection between the different petitions which we have now considered. 1. The Lord commands us to seek the true knowledge or profession of God, which is the cause of all his other blessings. 2. That God would rule us by his Spirit, and so continually confirm and preserve us in this knowledge. 3. That every one may by this means properly discharge his duty in his appropriate sphere and calling. 
for that he would give us those temporal blessings necessary that everyone may perform his duty. The fourth petition, therefore, agrees with the preceding, for if it is necessary that we should all be in our proper calling, we must live and have what is necessary for the support of life. Five, the petition for temporal and spiritual blessings follows next in order and is thrown in to meet our unworthiness, that thou mayest give us temporal and spiritual blessings, forgive us our debts. The fifth petition is therefore the foundation of the rest. If this be overthrown, the rest will likewise fall to the ground. For if any one has not the assurance that God is reconciled to him, how can he know him to be merciful? How can he continue in that knowledge which he has not? How can he do his duty and the will of God when he is the enemy of God and desires contrary to his will? How can the gifts of God contribute to his salvation? 6. After the petition for temporal and spiritual blessings, the petition for deliverance from present and future evils follows, being the last. From this last petition we return again to the first, deliver us from all the evils of guilt and punishment, present and future, that we may know thee, our perfect Saviour, that so thy name may be sanctified by us. Question 128. How dost thou conclude thy prayer? Answer, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for ever. That is, all these we ask of thee, because thou art our King and Almighty, art willing and able to give us all good. And all this we pray for, that thereby not we, but thy holy name may be glorified for ever. Exposition. This conclusion contributes to the confirmation of our faith, or to our confidence of being heard, seeing that God is willing and able to grant what we desire and pray for at his hands. Thine is the kingdom. The first reason is drawn from the duty of a king, which is to hear, defend, and preserve his subjects. Therefore thou, O God, since thou art our king, more powerful than all enemies, having all things in thy power, both good and evil, evil, so that thou art able to restrain and repress them, good, so that there is no blessing so great that thou canst not give, if it be agreeable to our nature, since we are thy subjects, be present with us by thy power, and save us, seeing thou hast a love for thy subjects, and canst preserve and defend them. And the power, the second reason is drawn from the power of God. Hear us, O God, and grant us all that we pray for, since thou art able, and thou alone, for this power rests in thee alone, being joined with infinite goodness. And the glory, the third reason is from the end or final cause. We ask these things for thy glory. We desire and look for all good things from thee, the only true and sovereign God. We profess and acknowledge thee as the author and fountain of all good things, because this glory is due thee. We therefore desire these things from thee. Therefore hear us for thy glory. For this petition and expectation of all good things from thee is nothing else than an ascription of honor and glory to thee. Hear us especially, since thou wilt grant us the things which we desire. Thou wilt do what contributes to thy glory. What we desire and pray for contributes to thy glory. Therefore, thou wilt grant it unto us. Give us, therefore, what we pray for, and the glory shall redound to thee, if thou deliver us. For so shall thy kingdom, power, and glory be manifested. Objection. We seem to bring persuasive arguments to God by which we may constrain and influence him to do for us what we pray for. But it is in vain that we use arguments with him who is unchangeable, God is unchangeable, therefore it is in vain that we thus plead with him. Answer, we grant the argument as it respects God, but not as it respects us. Or we may reply that there is here an error in taking that as a cause which is none. We do not use arguments that we may move and influence God, or persuade him to do what we ask, but that we ourselves may be persuaded that God will do this, that we may be assured of being heard, and acknowledge our necessity and the goodness and truth of God. These arguments are, therefore, not added to our prayers for the purpose of moving and influencing God, but merely to confirm and assure us that God will do what we desire and pray for. These now are the reasons on account of which he does it. Thou art the best king. Therefore, thou wilt give to thy subjects what is necessary and tends to their salvation. Thou art most powerful. Therefore, thou wilt show thy power in giving these greatest of all gifts, which can be given by no one besides thee. It shall contribute to thy glory, therefore thou wilt do it, because thou hast a regard to thy glory. Question 129. What does the word Amen signify? Answer. Amen signifies, it shall truly and certainly be, for my prayer is more assuredly heard of God, than I feel in my heart I desire these things of him. Exposition. 
The word Amen is not added as a part of the prayer, but is connected with it to denote, one, a true and sincere desire that we may be heard, that the thing which we desire and pray for may be ratified and certain, and that God would answer our request. Two, a certainty and profession of our confidence, or a confirmation of that faith by which we are fully persuaded that we shall be heard. The word Amen signifies, therefore, one, so let it be, or let that come to pass which we ask. Two, may God, who is not unmindful of his promise, certainly and truly hear us. End of section 81. End of commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism by Zacharias Osinus, translated by G. W. Williard.